Hello, everyone. Good to have you here. I am just checking the, the latest stock price, which is utterly incredible. I mean, really and truly incredible. When you look at this DJT, I just got to tell you one thing. Um, he must be feeling pretty good. I mean, you want to talk about Trump and Letitia. I mean, that is exactly what Donald Trump is somehow managing to do. Trump and Letitia at this moment because he just earned himself another cool billion dollars, more than a billion on paper, that is. We're going to talk all about that. Plus, oh my gosh, is NBC News turning into the next Fox News? And I say that because it seems that similar, dare I say, similar to Fox News, MSNBC has literally no control over its rank and file. I mean, you got Rachel Maddow out there saying what she's saying. You get Joy Reid. They're all like laughing about having gotten rid of Rana. Well, let me tell you, there's going to be a huge lawsuit. I mean, I don't know. Is it Dominion status? We'll leave that one to Fox mismanaging its talent so much that it winds up getting sued for nearly a billion dollars. I don't think it's going to cost him a billion, but I do think she's going to sue. She's going to sue and she's going to sue again. Wait till you find out who she hired for a lawyer. Rana McDaniels. This, this is like better than ever having to do the job. She's going to make so much more money than she ever would have if she had stayed, I'm sure, at MSNBC. Uh, Disney is dropping its lawsuit against Ron DeSantis in Florida. Wow, huge win for DeSantis. Way to go, Florida. Bob Iger, meanwhile, maybe nearing the end of his run, possibly, could it be? At Disney, the media, the Hollywood media, is now turning against him. I do want to express my condolences to Joe Lieberman, who is no longer with us. That news just coming in before air. 82, 82 years old, is that right, Drew? Um, he apparently fell, and, and this was related to complications from a fall. So it shows you how we do get vulnerable as we get older. We have more updates for you on the bridge. And P. Diddy, there's this uh, tape, this, this sound that I have to play for you that's really, really disturbing. That's a packed show, is it not? Welcome. Good to have you here. I am Trish Regan. This is the Trish Regan Show. If you haven't, make sure and you go and sign up at Trish Regan Media, trishreganmedia.com. And by the way, can we get 76 in there today, Drew? 76 research.com. That's the other place I really want you to go because this is my company. I started it with my good friend, Rob Horton, 76 research.com. And if you're concerned about your future and you want to invest and you want good, strong, hopefully very safe investments for your long-term future, you need to look at our model portfolios. The income builder right now has a discount of 20% for those that go to 76research.com. Go there and go to model portfolios and choose divs76. That's the code, 20% off, divs76. I'll talk a little bit more about it later on coming up, but beginning the show first here on Incredible news, just incredible news for Donald Trump. I mean, you really want to stick it to Letitia. This is the way to do it, folks, okay? He is trumping, pun intended, the entire Democrat Party right now. I mean, we'll see if it holds, but on paper, my gosh, every day he's like a billion plus richer. Take a look. I mean, wow. Shares, shares, they, they keep moving high. This is a story that was in the Daily Mail. It was valued at $8 billion. This was the, the, the first day. Now, now it's worth like another billion. It, it went up another billion dollars. It was the most actively, one of the most actively traded stocks on the entire street today. Just absolutely incredible. So this is putting his net worth somewhere between, oh, six to nine billion dollars. And now he makes Bloomberg's list. I mean, he made it yesterday, but now he's further up on the list, shall we say because he's one of the 500 richest people in the world. And it's all thanks to shares of DGT. But you know what? It's actually, it's thanks to everyone out there, like mom and pop investors that are like, wow, where can I get a share of DJT? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not necessarily, and I say this as somebody who you know is concerned about your long-term well-being as an investor, it's not something that I think necessarily is going to, pay off right away. I mean, maybe if they, if they can turn this thing into a business, keep in mind, they only have like 32 employees and they only made like three to 6 billion a million, forgive me, the valuation's way higher million dollars, which, you know, most times if you trade it 20 times earnings, you'd be at a valuation of 30 million bucks, but nope, this company is worth 
many, many billions, like $8 billion. And what's fascinating to me is, do you know that even when they filed and they were putting out their own sort of rosy PR spin on this, they were estimating at tops that they were worth a billion dollars. Well, now they're worth eight times that. So if that thing holds, ladies and gentlemen, he's going to have a lot of money. He's going he's gonna to be able to donate to Letitia. <laughs> Not that he ever should. Gosh, that woman really, really should be facing some consequences for what she did because it is damaging to the brand of America. It's damaging to the brand of New York City. What she did, just reckless, reckless use of the law for really, I think Trump has used this term as a kind of lawfare, right? Instead of warfare, it's a spin on that lawfare. She doesn't like Donald Trump. The Democrats want him taken out. And so that's what you do. You say, okay, we're going to find him. $453 million. They got half a billion dollars. And Americans say, yeah, you try that. He's got this little company you see. And I mean, it is little, <laughs> like it's little, you know, they're only earning like three to $6 million, putting the valuation at 30 to 60 million. And Americans are like, yeah, you know what? We want in. And so this is serving almost as a proxy. It shows you this momentum that is incredible behind Donald Trump right now. And I think this momentum is going to continue. I think that he's going to ride it all the way back to the White House come November, 2024. I feel like a broken record. I've been saying this every day since Friday. Oh my gosh, did you see? Shares of DWAC. It's merging with DJT, the parent company of True Social, which means that True Social will start trading on Tuesday on the NASDAQ. And, and so like we saw DWAC go up, 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 up and away. The deal happens. The shareholders approved it. Monday came, DWAC went higher. Tuesday came, I was here with you, and DWAC went higher. Actually, by then it was DJT. And here we are Wednesday. And DJT closed out the day. Ladies and gentlemen, this is incredible. Up 14.19%. I mean, that's wild. $66.22 a share. I mean... You know, they're saying like, this is the ultimate meme stock. It's a meme stock maybe, but in like so many interesting way ways, interesting ways in that Americans want to be heard. And, you know, they want to put their money where their mouth is, so to speak, or where their vote is, so to speak. So if this is a proxy, if you would, on November, 2024, it's going to be a really good November, possibly for Donald Trump. I mean, look, don't count your chickens before they hatch. And we've got some work to do, which is why we're all here. Make sure you subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, do me that favor right now. Subscribe to this show. Subscribe to this channel. It is so important. Give it a thumbs up, make a comment. I'm going to look at your live chat because it's happening in real time and I can see all your comments. Good to see you guys. I see so many familiar faces, but this is important stuff right now. We got a lot going on. So sure. Okay. Maybe it's a meme stock. Drew, do we have some of those meme stock valuations you can see? If it's a meme stock, it's uh it's way up there. Like it's it's one, two, three, four, five. It's the sixth highest valuation of any meme stock ever. And it's coming on March 26, 2024. I mean, it it actually rose another billion. <laughs> hey, Trump would be the first to tell us that, wouldn't he? He'd be like, no, it's worth another billion. So this thing has surpassed $8 billion, ladies and gentlemen, and he owns 60% of it. So he's feeling pretty good, as he should. He's been through hell and back. I don't wish that on anyone. It's the reason why I say it's so hard for, for people to go into politics nowadays, because who the heck would ever want that? Look at how they try and destroy you. Really, I mean, they, they just want to actually annihilate people that they don't agree with, and it's frightening. I mean, you see that happening with Rana, for example. I mean, I'm no Rana fan, I thought she needed to be out, of course, at, at the RNC. I mean, you can't spend $70,000 on flowers, as it was reported, and not win elections. But really, it, it's become so much their way or the highway. And so congratulations to him. Congratulations to Devin Nunes, who left Congress to run this company for Donald Trump. 
Congrats to some of the, the directors on the board. You've got Robert Lighthouser, who used to be in the administration, Linda McMahon, who used to be in the administration, running Small Business Administration. You've got, uh, you've got Cash Patel over there, and uh, quite, quite a team, and of course his son that are there on the board of directors. They may actually have some leniency. I'll be interested to see whether they allow him to borrow against his shares at some point to help pay, for example, this massive... <laughs> $125 million, because I'm sorry, okay, it may not be half a billion, but $125 million is a heck of a lot for, for something that had no victim, like a crime that has no victim, and you've got bail, it set it, bond, I should say, set at $125 million, or you've got to sell everything? Come on! they got four cases against him, and I'll tell you, he's riding it all the way to the White House. In my view, the more they attack him, the more successful he is, and this share price for a company that has few employees and and no business really to speak of like let's be honest i mean elon is having a tough time over at twitter so things are tough over on truth i'm on truth by the way Truth social if you want to follow me there at trish regan but it's incredible so a great day ending the day at 66 dollars and 22 cents i don't know if the momentum can keep up i i'll, I'll just say this it's going to be one wild ride um Part of what's going on, again, is that this is a proxy for November. And as we look at all the polls that have come in, there is a new update. Bloomberg was all excited because they did a Bloomberg morning consult poll. And they're like, oh, you see, he's actually improving. He's like tied in Pennsylvania now. And he's tied in Michigan now because some of the polls had him like 10 points ahead in some of these places. And of course, Biden was flipping out and Biden was flipping out so badly that apparently word has it he started swearing at his staff. And so they went and found him a new poll, I guess. So Bloomberg out with a new poll. Let's show those numbers, Drew, because these are interesting to see. What I'll tell you about these numbers that you're seeing, not these, because that's, that's where I'm going. What you, what you see with these numbers, which there we go. Okay. So these numbers on the screen right now show you Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, North Carolina. That's where he's ahead. And, and he's looking as though he's, you know, in pretty decent territory, but Pennsylvania, Michigan, he's now allegedly tied there and Wisconsin, Wisconsin's always been hit or miss. He was actually down in Wisconsin quite a bit. And then he pulled ahead and now it looks like Biden's up one. I can tell you that the, um, the, the sort of over under here on this poll is a, a percentage point. So it could be that, you know, maybe that he's tied in Wisconsin. But Donald Trump is really looking forward to one thing. He's really looking forward <laughs> to Kennedy out there as a competitor. Because RFK, and I met him years ago, actually, when I was at Bloomberg, and he was trying to get oil, I think he did get oil, from Venezuela, imported into Boston, and it was kind of Hugo Chavez's way at the time of being like F you, you know, because oil prices were so high and Boston couldn't afford, afford heating oil. And Chavez was like, see, my socialist communist country down here in Venezuela is so great. And RFK was all about that. And so I remember interviewing him at that time on set. And so it was the first time I'd met him. And I think there's a lot of interesting things about him. I appreciate some of the things that he's brought to light about modern medicine, for example. I think he's very interesting on those topics. And he's pointed out some issues that are important as we try to understand these pharmaceutical companies and you know, the, the lack of liability, frankly, that they have um, in, in many of these vaccines that are required. So I think that's all interesting, right? Interesting to understand about RFK. And I think he brings some valid and if, if not valid at times, just at least debatable topics, right? Some valid debates, I should say, to the table. And so I value him for that. But like, let's face it, the guy is a socialist, all right? He's a Democrat. He's a lefty. And now he's got this Nicole Shanahan... <laughs> Nicole Shanahan as his VP. And, um, well, let me just give you some perspective on this one. She was married to Sergey Brin. She's the ex-wife. She's 30-something years old, and she's super lefty, and she droned on and on and on and on in the announcement. I'm going to just play you, like, a few seconds, and then we're going to talk. I am so hopeful for this. I hope you all understand now what has brought me into politics. <laughs> Hasn't it? And, it? and what in this moment, I, 
I am leaving the Democratic Party. Okay. But she's really a Democrat. So you can see him there. He's, he's proud of her. Well, this thing just goes on and on and on. She's leaving the Democrat Party. She's got a ton of money. You know, she's the one who paid for his $500,000 Super Bowl commercial. I mean, she was married to the Google founder, for goodness sakes. I hope she got something out of that divorce. <laughs> so she's got all the money and she's going to help bankroll him. And Trump could not be happier. I mean, it's like everything's going his way. Truth Social is making him billions. And Nicole Shanahan and RFK have teamed up. He writes on Truth, RFK Jr. is the most radical left candidate in the race by far. He's a big fan of the Green News scam and other economy-killing disasters. He's referring there to ESG, which is one of the reasons I started 76 Research, incidentally. I guess this would mean he is going to be taking votes from crooked Joe Biden, which would be a great service to America. His running mate, Nicole Shanahan, is even more liberal than him, if that's possible. Kennedy is a radical left Democrat and always will be. It's great for MAGA, but the communists will make it very hard for him to get on the ballot. Expect him and her to be indicted any day now, probably for environmental fraud. <laughs> that would be funny. He is Crooked Joe Biden's political opponent, not mine. I love that he's running. Of course he loves that he's running, because let me show you these polls. This is the number, you know, we started, I showed you the other poll numbers where you can see, like, you know, he's ahead. But once you add RFK in there, He's really ahead. So if you look at all the polls that are out there right now, and this is one of the things that Real Clear Politics does, they look at the averages and they say Trump is leading Biden by two points. I actually think that that's somewhat understated because I don't think people are totally truthful when they talk about who they're voting for to those pollsters. They never, ever want to say Trump like they're afraid to say Trump. And you understand why. I mean, for goodness sakes, you can go buy a share, or maybe sort of quietly, privately, of true social, but to actually tell the pollster that you're going to vote for Trump, well, that's a whole other thing. So consequently, they're not always forthcoming. Therefore, I think these numbers are actually better than what you see. He's ahead two points, but that's in a two candidate race. If you put Kennedy in there, what happens? Oh, he jumps to a 4.3% margin over Joe Biden. So he doubles his lead. It's incredible, incredible, incredible. And then if you look at a five candidate race, if you have Kennedy's support dwarfing that of Jill Stein and Cornell West, well, these polls, they say, tell the same tale. In RCP averages, that's real clear politics, Trump's lead grows from 5.4 to 7% in Arizona, from 5% to 7.4% in Georgia, from 4 to 6.4% in Nevada, 5 to 7.7% in North Carolina, 0.5% to 2.7% in Pennsylvania, and 1.2% to 3.7% in Wisconsin, where he's kind of struggling right now. Michigan is the outlier. They say Trump's lead actually drops slightly because maybe some people in Michigan are actually going for RFK and the, the, the um, margin goes down from 3.9 to 3.3%. So interesting. And you can see why the left is getting all worked up. You had Jen Psaki, who's the former press person at the White House. She was on her program or somebody's program over on a MSNBC. And here's what she had to say. Watch. And science okay. and all sorts of other things. Right. But I will say, Mika, I, I was nodding along as Tom was just talking. I think this mm -hmm. is the biggest challenge. There, There is unquestionably Trump has a, a broad support in his base, as we've just been yeah. discussing. And we've seen that play out in the primary. That's the only piece, though, we know at this point. He has problems among independents and problems with an expanded electorate. But these third party candidates are a huge, huge, huge problem. And there's mm -hmm. a number of them. If you look at RFK Jr., it's the name recognition issue, as Tom was just talking about. And there are still states in this country. Uh, obviously, I mean, Georgia is one of them, I will name, where the Kennedy name is beloved. Right? 
right? Where people may just not right. still, where they may just not know a lot about the fact that he is an anti-vaxxer who's a conspiracy theorist. They don't know that yet. So this is something, there is an aggressive effort that the campaign has been working with the Democratic National Committee on to run on this, but it needs to be broad. People need to be shouting it from the rooftops because this is the one of the biggest threats um, to Joe Biden being reelected is these third party candidates. If you look at Michigan, Mika, and I know uh, Sen uh, Alicia, Alyssa Slotkin is going to be on later. I almost called her yeah. Senator. Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin is going to be on <laughs> later. Michigan is a state where RFK, I think, is polling at 10 percent. Right. And so this is a oh. place where Joe Biden needs to win. And RFK Jr. is making a real threat to that. So it's a threat, a real threat, a big threat. These third party candidates, how dare they? How dare anybody else get into the race? Well, if he's that big a threat, I think that Trump could be right. You know, they have, they have ways of dealing with those things, right? I'll be very curious to see how this shakes out and whether or not he gets into a lot of trouble. Because when you look at those polling numbers, one thing is very clear over and over and over again, to me anyway, it's that the Democrats in general don't trust Joe Biden. When I've dug into some of these numbers, what I found is if you look at the spread between Trump and Biden, when it can be rather narrow on the who you're going to vote for, when you look at the economy, you're seeing a 20 point difference. When you're seeing the border, you're looking at a 30 point difference. I mean, a 30 point difference, you guys. That shows you Americans are like, Biden can't do it. And Democrats are saying the same thing. And over and over and over again, they keep coming back and saying he's too old. He's just too old and we're concerned about him. Rightly so. I mean, how many times have we seen the tape of him falling? Which, you know, it's, it's real. At a certain age, you run these risks. And I, I just want to give a, a brief shout out to Joe Lieberman, who we have just learned has passed away, 82 years old. Joe Lieberman passing away reportedly from complications tied to a fall. So he was, he was known for being kind of a maverick and an independent and really, um, you know, really was, was, was kind of neat in that sense. I remember interviewing him on stage at an event that was for school choice and for voucher programs for kids. And it, it's something I always appreciated and loved about him as a candidate. Joe Lieberman was willing to cross the aisle when push came to shove for the for the issues that mattered to him. So school choice was one of them. And he felt very passionately that, that everybody should be able to go to the best possible institution they could go to. And you shouldn't have to be subjected to whatever the teachers union just wants to send your way. But you know, he was, um, he was a Democrat, but one that really saw himself, I think fundamentally as an independent and therefore was unpredictable. He was Al Gore's running mate. 82 years old, originally from Stanford, Connecticut. So a New Englander, of course, died in New York City. As I said, complications from a fall. And that's unfortunately the reality, you know, for anyone. But as you get older, remember Donald Trump's ex-wife, Ivana Trump, died from complications from a fall. I mean, this is this is what happens, right? So um, my, my heart's and Prayers and thoughts all go out to his family right now in their grieving, but he certainly leaves behind a, an incredible legacy. And regardless of what you thought of the guy, you got to admire somebody who's willing to stand up for what they believe. This gets us back to Donald Trump because he's willing to take on a lot. Like, I don't think he had any idea how much he was going to be taking on. He was willing to go places on the policy front that no other politician dared to go. I mean, we've had an institution, state-like institutions in, in place for years and years and years and decades and decades. And they're like, wait a second, who's this guy who suddenly thinks that he can change the game? And he thought he could, believe me. And I have, um, I have a friend who used to work at the CIA and he called my friend into the Oval Office and sat him down and said, hey, you know, I, I want the lay of the land. Who can I trust here? <laughs> my friend's like, no one. <laughs> and it's one of the reasons why instead of getting all the debris from the staff, he'd, he'd look up at the screen because he wanted to hear it in real time. I'm telling you, we are on the front lines of history right now, ladies and gentlemen, every single day here, you and me together, 
big reminder, subscribe, subscribe to the show, give it thumbs up, write a comment, join the chat, all that. Join the team. You can join Team Regan because we have our live little sessions on Fridays. I'll be having another one of those where we just talk privately. But listen, I am telling you, this is history in the making. And so why wouldn't you want to actually always hear from the individuals themselves that are involved? Why do you have to hear from every Tom, Dick and Harry in the state department? Now, I mean, maybe there's a few good ones over there and you want to listen and hear them out, but don't you want contrasting opinions at all time? I remember visiting them in the oval office and you know, the oval office is a little bit like a set because Everything is super clean. You know, there's not a paper on the desk. Every, the, the, the pillows are fluffed on the couches. But where he worked, and he showed me, you go through this narrow hallway, and then you go to this room. It's not very large. The furniture's kind of decrepit because it's been there a long time, and they really could use a little refurbishing. You know, we need to get, like, my antique guy in there to kind of spiff it up a little bit. I mean, you can stick with the furniture, but you might want to you know, shine it, you know, do a little, uh, what do they call that when you, you polish it a little bit? So it was, it was old. It was a little bit rickety. And it, it reminds you, me anyway, of like one grandmother's table. There's like a big dining room table in there. And that was where he worked. He would have his computer on one side and then all the TVs up on the wall, every single one of them, because he wanted to see everything in real time. I and mean, we're talking, everyone was up there. So think about that versus what the State Department is offering and what the experts are offering, where they pour over all these documents. I mean, are they talking to the real people on the ground? In many cases, yes, and that's great. But I think he also thought to himself, well, I can look up at the screen and in many cases hear from that real person on the ground or that real person in Timbuktu. And I, I appreciated that about him. I, I think he was very hungry for information. He just absorbed it in a different way and absorbed it in sort of a real-time way as opposed to the book learned way where somebody else is spoon feeding it to you. It's kind of symbolic of everything that's going on right now, right? I mean, why do I not want to be in a network? Because I don't want to have to read a teleprompter. I don't want to have to do the stories that they're telling me I have to do. I don't want to get a kick in the pants because I have the good sense, the good sense to say that coronavirus was being turned into a political event and then have it blow up into a giant story and have my own employer not be there for me. Like I want that. If you are good enough, Ladies and gentlemen, if you are good enough, you can do your own thing. If you have your own conviction and he proved it as a presidential candidate, you didn't need all the money in the world. He could do his own thing and he still doesn't have all the money in the world. Right? I mean, they got to pay a lot of legal bills there at the RNC. It's draining his personal wealth. It's a drain on the family. I can't even imagine like how one goes to sleep at night dealing with that. So I think America's looking again, bring, keep bringing it back to True Social, but America looks at True Social and says, hey, let's do our part. How can we help him? I think America sees Donald Trump as more with it. It's why when you see all of these polls, he continues to succeed. They see Joe Biden, on the other hand, as really suffering. And there are a lot of worries that this suffering may be much bigger than we think, right? When you're falling that much, when you seem to lose track of your thought process, when, when the lawyer who's going after you for taking documents and hiding them in your garage next to your Corvette says he can't even move forward with prosecution because no jury will convict the guy because he just seems like a sad, poor old man. My word's not exactly his, but effectively that's the gist of it, right? Because a lot of people worry there might be something else going on. And I say this as somebody who has had loved ones who have suffered from dementia. I am not a doctor. I don't know, but I've seen some of these things before. So it makes sense that the American people want to know more. And yet, and yet... There's like no go territory. I mean, Corinne Jean-Pierre, rocket scientist that she is as a uh, PR person. <laughs> I mean, Peppermint Patty was better than her, okay? Like, at least Peppermint Patty, like, wouldn't actually just get herself into bad situations. She had enough intelligence to lie through her teeth which is why I hate those jobs and I could never do that. But, you know, I, I'm just a little too forthcoming, a little too honest. But Corinne Jean-Pierre tries to lie, but she's not quick enough on the uptake that she can actually do it. 
So in this case, she just kind of rage quit an interview and everybody's talking about this. Like, did, did Jean-Pierre, did she just quit? And so that's like one of the things trending on the inter- internet right now. What she quit. It was an interview that she was doing with a, I think it was a Columbus, Ohio radio station. Let, let's take a listen and listen to the rage quit in real time because the reporter dared to ask this. And remember, it's no go. When I told a number of people that I was talking to you today, it was interesting, though, they all said, would you please just ask her, does the president have dementia? And so before I move on from that, does he? Have- that, Mark, Mark, I can't even believe you're asking me this question. That is a credibly offensive question to ask. But you know uh, people is, ask it. Wait, oh, let me, no, 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 no. You, Mark, you, 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 you t- you're taking us down this rabbit hole. Let me, uh, let me, uh, let me be very clear about this. Uh, for the past several years, the president's physician has laid out very com- in a comprehensive way uh, the president's health. Uh, this is a president, if you watch him every day, if you really pay attention to his record and what he has done, you will see exactly how focused he's been on this, the American people, how historic his actions has been. And so I'm not even going to truly, truly, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, really... You know, take take the premise of your question. I think it is uh, incredibly insulting. And uh, and so we can, you know, we can move on to the next question. Gas prices and grocery prices, then. Big topics here in North Carolina. How does uh, Mr. Biden win votes when people don't have as much disposable income? Look, the president understands. Uh, he grew up in, in a middle-class family, a working-class family in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He gets it. He understands how difficult it is for Americans who are sitting around their kitchen table every month trying to figure out what they're going to pay for. You have to remember when the president walked into this administration, there were multiple crises happening. There was COVID. There was uh, the economy was in the tailspin because of the last administration, because of what the, the president oh, they're, they're Trump left him. us with. Now you're asking me about gas prices. The president took action on gas prices. Let's not forget Russia's invasion on Ukraine skyrocketed prices of gas. And because the president took action, we see we are in a different place than we were a year ago in gas prices. Uh, Eggs, milk, uh, seafood products, uh, all the important uh, groceries, those costs have gone down because of what this president has been able to do. And And with that, thank you so much, Mark. Have an amazing, amazing day. Wow. 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 See ya. I mean, Mark, Mark, this, this, you, listen, I am nominating you to get a press corps badge and you need to go to the White House. I'm sorry, but you asked three, four incredibly salient, important questions that are all front of mind. Nothing out of bounds, no baba booing or anything like that, right? And you did it exactly right on. And, uh, and yet she rage quit. I mean, she was like, yep, see ya. I mean, maybe. Maybe she knew she was just lying so badly because, ladies and gentlemen, the price of everything has gone up. Everything. Like eggs are way up. You see, because Karine Jean-Pierre, I realize inflation went to 9.8% and it's come down from the 9.8%. But you see, this is cumulative. Like it goes up and then it doesn't go down. It, it maybe goes up again, but it's down from being way up. Does that make sense, guys? So like, Inflation is sky high. Wages are not. And so when you look at the price of everything adjusted for inflation, it's way up, way up, way up. And when you look at wages adjusted for inflation, way down, okay? Like not way down, but they're up, but not to the extent that they were. So back in the day, Pre-Biden, you had a middle class that was thriving. For the first time in 50 years, we actually saw median incomes grow the most, the most in 50 years. Why? Because it's not that hard. You just need good policies. Thank you very much. It's one of the reasons why I am so excited to support my friends at American for Prosperity. Americans for Prosperity, these guys get it. They understand policy. They know what works. They know how hard, they know how hard it is. You want to tell me the guy from Scranton, Pennsylvania knows? He doesn't. Okay. He is so far gone from that. He's got a Corvette in his garage after all. Right. And he makes 
or his son makes millions of dollars as a, quote, consultant of some sort for industries that he knows nothing about while his dad is VP, I'm sorry, he is not a kid from Scranton. Not in any way, shape, or form. Well, Americans for Prosperity, they get it. They know how we need good policy, good economic policy in order to have a thriving economy that's a meritocracy that benefits everyone. So go check them out, americansforprosperity.org. They are committed to making sure that, you know what, if Donald Trump gets in there, and let's hope he does, ladies and gentlemen, again, <laughs> if true social is any indication, that's good news. Um, but in all seriousness, the polls show that he's going to have a very, very good November. So we'll see a lot can happen between now and then, which is why they're working overtime to make sure that we've got the Senate and that we've got the House, because you need all of it, okay? If you get the Oval Office, great. But you know what? If you've got a whole bunch of Democrats controlling things over there on Capitol Hill, you're not going to get your policies through, so we won't get those lower taxes. Taxes. We won't get that border wall. We won't get all the things that we do need in order to see our country succeed. So americansforprosperity.org. Here's a question. Is MSNBC on its way to becoming the next Fox News? I mean, from a management perspective, right? Because the management at MSNBC, well, it seems to have literally no control over anyone that works there. Like those people work there, they get a paycheck. They're not choosing to go out on their own like me or like Tucker or Bongino or a lot of like big personalities. No, 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 these people work for MSNBC, which is owned by NBC News, which is owned by Comcast. Just like there are people that work for Fox News, which is owned by the Murdoch family primarily and some shareholders big institutional shareholders there. You have Fox A and Fox B, class shares. Well, I just say this because clearly management had no control over anything that was going on at Fox. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had to pay like a nearly billion dollars in a lawsuit there to Dominion. So the management at Fox, and, and Tucker's actually made some really funny comments about this, um, about the, the scared women that are running the place right now. But I can tell you as someone who used to be there, um, yeah, they're scared. They're scared for their jobs. There's no leadership. And when you have a vacuum of leadership, you have the inmates running the asylum. And so this makes a lot of investors and that experience, and the stock's tanked, by the way, since that Dominion thing, um, and the loss of Tucker and sort of the onset of this new media mechanism by which you can get content free right here. Remember to subscribe and hit the like and make a comment and share and do all that good stuff. But given all these changes in the media industry and the, the increasing challenges that they face as a result of that, plus you layer in a really bad management team, Fox has its trouble. And then you look over at MSNBC and it's like, I, I see the handwriting on the wall right now because all the talent's like, well, I don't need this. Do I really need this? And if they don't really need this, they don't need this gig and they probably don't need those gigs but they are employed there. So, you know, hey, it is your employer. You're collecting a paycheck. You'd think you might try to do what your bosses want you to do. Not these guys. Do we have the original tape when Rana was first hired? So Rana McDaniel, you know, no love lost, right? I, I don't think that she did the best job for the RNC. However, I'll tell you, this lady didn't deserve what she got. So she signs a deal with MSNBC for two years at 300 grand a year. So $600,000, she signs a deal, everything's done. She goes on and makes her first appearance on this weekend show that they have, and then all H-E-double-L breaks loose. Let's cue the tape. I'll be joined by former RNC chair, Rhonda McDaniel, in her first interview since stepping down as party chair. In full disclosure to our viewers, this interview was scheduled weeks before it was announced that McDaniel would become a paid NBC News contributor. This will be a news interview, and I was not involved in her hiring. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation. And look, there's a reason why there's a lot of journalists at NBC News uncomfortable with this, because many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting, mm. have been met with character assassination. We weren't asked our opinion of the hiring, but if we were, we would have strongly objected to it. NBC News, either wittingly or unwittingly, is teaching election deniers that what they can do stretches well beyond appearing on our air in interviews to peddle lies about the sanctity and integrity of our elections, but that they can do that as one of us 
as badge-carrying employees of NBC so News. Special. There is an easy way to avoid the controversy NBC News has stumbled into. Don't hire anyone close to the crimes. She literally backed an illegal scheme to steal an election in the state of Michigan. That is the type of experience that Ronna McDaniel brings to the table. And that experience does not get us to a deeper understanding of anything in the public debate. I want to associate myself with all my colleagues, both at MSNBC and at NBC News, who, who have voiced loud and principled objections to our company putting on the payroll someone who hasn't just attacked us as journalists, um, but someone who is part of an ongoing project to get rid of our system of government. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hey, it's like Rachel really speaks for everyone, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna back all my colleagues on this. Not like I've promoted conspiracy theory after conspiracy theory after conspiracy theory myself. I mean, we can go back to the dossier and then some, right? She's the queen of conspiracy theories. All right, there's no journalism there. Trust me. She's not a journalist. She's an intriguing commentator. I, I mean, I can go down that rabbit hole any day, right? Like, she's just leaving all these little breadcrumbs with her conspiracy theory BS. And people are like, oh, glued, even though it's all lies. That's what she does. And somehow, oh, you're all high and mighty. Jen Psaki, who was the PR person, for goodness sake, she's suddenly a journalist? I don't think so. Hey, you know what? I was a journalist when I was 10. Mm hmm. Hampton Union newspaper, fifth grade. <laughs> I've been a journalist for a long time and I actually take it seriously. But I'll tell you this anybody who's fair can be a journalist nowadays. Those people are not fair. They are commentators, they are entertainers, and they are hoitier than you could ever. Hoity toity thinking they're so much better than poor Ron McDaniel who signs a deal and then the impotent management over at MSNBC is they're, they're like totally intimidated by the likes of their talent. I mean, for goodness sakes, MSNBC, you guys own the airwaves. You own it. The bosses own it. You know, just fire them, okay? Fire them all. Fire them all. I bet you anything you could come up with a better B team tomorrow and America would be better for it and your ratings would be better for it too. But they don't think that way because they're like Fox, they're super scared of everyone. And so the, the, the guy who runs the place, Caesar Conde, he came out with a statement. Do we have that one, Drew? And he's like, oh my gosh, we didn't realize we made such a mistake. I mean, we can't have a Republican on the air, right? No, 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 you can only have never Trumpers. If you're gonna have a Republican, you need a never Trumper, like that, that girl with the really long hair and the, the, the jaw, what is her name, who does the four o'clock thing. Anyway, quote, there is no doubt that there's the last several days that have been very difficult for news group. After listening to the legitimate concerns of many of you, I have decided that Ronna McDaniel will not be an NBC News contributor. After listening to the concerns that you aired on primetime TV. Conde said the initial decision was made due to the network's deep commitment to, and I'm quoting, presenting our audiences with a widely diverse set of viewpoints and experiences, particularly during these consequential times. Except apparently you don't care about your audience, do you, Conde? Because the B team that's full of conspiracies that you have on your airwaves and clearly are paying way too much and have given too much power to, they didn't like her, so you took her off. Ironically, he writes, the big boss could not, oh, no, this is the, the Daily Mail's or Daily Caller. I can't remember which one, but a, a reporter's view of it. Um, the big boss could not uphold the network's so-called value for diverse viewpoints as he quickly succumbed to the whines of his far left hosts who have been furiously calling for McDaniel's ouster since her first appearance as a contributor. That's a good line. I believe it's from Daily Caller. Anyway, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, this guy, come on. He said, I want to personally apologize to our team members who felt we let them down. While this was a collective recommendation by some members of our leadership team, I approved it and take full responsibility for it. So you see two things there. He's like, oh, I'm in charge. And actually this wasn't my idea, not my idea at all. <laughs> I mean, what a loser, seriously, what a freaking loser. And so 
I'd be watching shares of Comcast right now. Maybe NBC doesn't matter that much to them, but the ratings for MSNBC, I don't know how they are these days. I mean, they seem to be in a solid second place consistently to Fox. And I guess, I guess if you're of the mindset that you can make money there because of all this ESG nonsense, these ESG people want to advertise on your network, then there you go. Um, but really and truly, it's just, it's crazy. You know, uh, Donald Trump weighed in on this. I believe we have his comments. Donald Trump saying, like, this isn't fair what they did to Ron. It's totally not fair. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And he writes, and he's right. What boss or executive would allow a man or woman, in this case, sleepy eyes Chuck Dodd, who was fired for dismal performance coupled with horrendous television ratings, to publicly scold them as to their weakness and stupidity in hiring Ronna McDaniel. I totally agree with this. Really, I mean, they, they just got lashed on live TV. And this idiot CEO or whatever he is, president of the news division, is like terrified of his anchors. Actually, they should be scolded for hiring Sleepy for Meet the Fake Breasts and keeping him for so long despite his poor performing skills, bad ratings, and his bias. The sick degenerates over... Oh, he's not holding back at MSNB, MSDNC, that's a good one, are really running NBC. And there seems nothing Chairman Brian Roberts can do about it. Oh, poor Brian. Chuck Todd, of all people, viciously giving Roberts a piece of his small mind and then berating him for hiring Rana without his or the other lunatic's approval was just a step too far. Brian's great-grandfather would have fired Chuck Todd and the rest of these losers on the spot. Perhaps Brian still will. If I knew Rana was going to troubled MSNBC, I would have advised her to change her name back to Romney. She would have had a far better chance. So he's referring to Brian Roberts, who I'm sure can't be too psyched about any of this. I mean, Brian Roberts is a businessman. He tends to, as most businessmen are be sort of, you know, down the middle, but a little bit more right when it comes to some of the economic issues. And so I'm sure he's not psyched about this. And he looks like a tool as well. I mean, I realize that Caesar's taken the, 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 the brunt of the fault, although maybe it was Brian. Maybe Brian's idea was to hire Rana because maybe he actually thinks there's an opportunity to have these dialogues. Well, these dialogues can't be had there. I mean, say what you want about Fox and believe me, I, in this show have said plenty, but no one would have actually done to Donna Brazil what these people at MSNBC did to Ronna McDaniel. I mean, Donna was on our air. Everybody was fine with it. I mean, maybe they didn't agree with her. Maybe they didn't like what she had done, you know, the whole slip in the questions at, at the debate when she was at CNN. But allegedly, I think I, maybe she came out and admit that. I, I don't know. I, I digress. Whatever. The point is, she was a Democrat, a big Democrat, and everybody at Fox was fine with it. She went on The Five. She, I think, was on my show from time to time, you know? We're fine. Like, everyone on the left is the one with the problem. They're the ones that are like, I can't hear it. I can't hear it. It's offending me. I can't have a Trump sign outside my dorm room even though he's the Republican nominee for president, for goodness sakes. We had to go through that, didn't we? Anyway, good news is um, Ron is going to get a big settlement. More on that in a second. But before I do, yeah, I just want you to see this because the anchors actually had something to say. They were like high-fiving each other because, you see, they won. And this is some big game to them. Take a look at Joy Reid and Rachel Maddow celebrating that they got Ron fired. Um, so something happened. Another thing happened that is not about the abortion situation. Um, our chairman of the of the NBC Universal News Group, Cesar Conde, uh, who we both know very well, um, he sent a memo that we all got as employees here, uh, rescinding the hiring of Ronna Romney McDaniel. And I know I felt very strongly about it. I know you felt very strongly about it. I think everyone from four o'clock on, from Nicole all the way to midnight, we all felt very strongly and said so on our respective shows uh, yesterday. And I, I just have to say, when somebody does the right thing. I feel like it should be acknowledged as publicly as we acknowledged our outrage. And so I, I know how I feel about it. I am grateful to Caesar for actually making the right decision. I think it was the right decision, but I want to get your take as well. Oh, well, thank you for asking me about it. I, I still feel like I still I still feel like a little it, it always feels wrong to talk about things, you know, in the company Agreed. as if it's news. And, I, you know, it's, just it this, it's yeah. not the way either you or I are, are wired, all. I know. But I 
I will just say that journalists are a fractious bunch. And in our big company with all sorts of different journalistic entities, you have all sorts of different people working in this business, doing all sorts of different kinds of work. And to see the essentially unanimous feeling among all the journalists in this building That's and all it. the sort of senior staff and all the producers and everybody in this building about this was one thing. But then to see the executives and the leadership hear that and respond to it and be willing to change course based on it, based on their respect for us and hearing what we argued. I I have deep respect for that. I do, I, I mean what I said on the air last night on my show that I think that like, yes, acknowledging I the power. that you might've gotten something wrong is a real sign of strength, a real show of strength. And I think it's a show of strength and I think it's a show of respect for the people who work at this company and who make us who we are, um, that leadership was willing to change on this. And I'm, I'm grateful to them. You know, it's not about hiring a Republican. It's not even about hiring somebody who has Trump ties. This was a really specific case because yeah. of Ms. McDaniel's and uh, her involvement in the election interference stuff. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that our, our leadership was willing to do the, I think, the, the bold, strong, uh, Yeah, 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 thing. yeah. You know what? This lady's just grateful. She's like, I'm like CEO of the joint. You know what? My ability to rally the troops and have everybody complain on live TV, that's what it's really about. So I'm psyched. Well, you just get as psyched as you want because you know what? You're going to take your company right down the tubes there. And I'm telling you, Brian Roberts has himself a problem. Brian owns Comcast and he's got himself a very large problem because the inmates are running the asylum. You have just created these and bred these people that are just so far out in left field, literally, that they now have a huge issue and they're going to have to pay for it. So... Rana just went on TV and earned the most money that probably anyone's going to earn on TV, like by the second. I mean, if you work these numbers out, I mean, so 600 grand, but they're going to have to pay her more. Mark my words. She just hired Brian Friedman. And Brian Friedman is a killer attorney who has negotiated the exits of, let's see, Tucker Carlson, Megyn Kelly, actually from NBC, um, Don Lemon, who walked away with 20 some odd million. <laughs> oh my gosh. What were they thinking? At CNN? I mean, Friedman's like, I think he did Chris Cuomo's exit there too. I'm, I'm not positive on that. I think he did. Anyway, so he's, he's kind of one of these badass attorneys. And that means Comcast is going to have to pay up. NBC's parent, Comcast, is going to get stuck with a big bill because she's going to sue and she's going to sue and she's going to sue him again because she's got a lot to sue on now. In other words, you sign a deal, you're supposed to get the money, right? So she's got to get the money that she was going to get. But simultaneously, like, look at what they did to her and her reputation. I mean, for goodness sakes, I mean, talking about bad faith. There's a case there. There is definitely a case there. And, you know, my friend Hugh Hewitt, he said so much while appearing on my former network. Watch. About this thing. Well, Rana is a friend, and I did work for NBC, and in November I worked with Caesar and Rebecca and the whole team. I've never seen anything this brutal uh, since I got started in the media in 1990. Rana is going to sue everyone who defamed her for breach of contract, for intentional infliction of mental distress, they are going to sue for the destruction of her business opportunities that come from being on TV. I think they made a terrible decision and they allowed the MSNBC bleed to take over their network and the cult has taken over the news division and it's going to hurt the 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump are not going to watch NBC News. Boom. Not that they watched NBC to begin with. You know, they might have watched NBC News though. Think about it. Because the Today Show is really different than MSNBC. So if you watch the Today Show, you probably shouldn't if you like Donald Trump. If you watch NBC Nightly News, you probably shouldn't. If you watch that weekend program that Chuck Todd used to host that some Kristen Walker, Welker host now, well, I don't know what to say to you if you watch that, okay? <laughs> like, you're on your own. Um, but the other shows that present themselves as being like, okay, we're news, they're not really news. And this is exposing that. And so I do think that their ratings overall could suffer. And I do think she's going to sue them like nobody's business. I'm seeing you guys are so complimentary today. Thank you for that.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because uh, I, I, I appreciate uh, your warm comments. I will get out to some of those in, in just a moment. But again, just a reminder, please make sure you subscribe. Please make sure you hit thumbs up. Please make sure you share this. The other thing, I, I have an assignment for you. I'm going to put this in the chat right now, and I want you to go. I want you to go take a look at my new company, 76research.com. I'm really proud of it because I care so much about everybody's ability to invest for the long term. I really do. And when you look at all this sort of ESG centric stuff that's going on, this ESG, okay, well, we got to hit this, you know, the, this demo and, and this particular demographic and this and that on our board of directors, instead of caring about making sure you have the best people in place. I mean, this is, this is part of the whole problem right now. And, you know, whether it's MSNBC or whether it's Disney, which I'm going to talk about momentarily, any of these companies are really turning into large problems in that they're not focused on profitability as much as they are on all this other nonsense. And they, they've lost their way, just like Joe Biden has lost his way. And so I don't want you to lose your way. You need to have a clear head as an investor. We have the 76 report there. Actually, the new edition comes out this Friday. So you can sign up for the 76 report. Or you can sign up for one of the portfolios. I had Rob on the show just yesterday talking about the income builder portfolio. Really great dividend stocks that you can rely on, hopefully, for one day when you're going to retire. So 10 to 15 names in there. Um, Rob has been on Wall Street 20, 25 years and I, I've been talking to him for years about this venture, which has been so important and close to my heart, something I wanted to do for a really, really long time. And we both had very similar convictions about it. So we teamed up, we created 76 Research. I want you to go there. I want you to sign up at least for the free stuff. Make sure you get the free stuff because there's plenty of free stuff on there too. Um, but the model portfolios are really, really, and we have, as I said at the top of the show, a code right now that's running through Easter for the dividend portfolio. That's the income builder, the income builder portfolio. Just type in divs for dividends. I'm going to put this in there too. Code divs for dividends 76. Three guesses where that 76 came from. I was so inspired. You know me, I'm a 1776. Anyway, um, I want to turn to another story that actually is sort of related to this um, ESG nonsense because, you know, Disney is a huge problem these days. Disney has become so woke, too woke for its own good. But, you know, they're getting a taste of their own medicine because Ron DeSantis wasn't having it. Ron DeSantis down in Florida was like, you know, guys, this ain't flying this isn't working and uh, he was right to do this so big news out today that disney got beat by none other than the state of florida and ron desantis i'll share with you the headline from the journal here wall street journal disney succumbs to ron desantis in fight over florida tax district you better believe it you better believe that one i mean i'll tell you disney deserved this in some ways. I mean, like, look, I have mixed feelings. I have mixed feelings about Ron. I think that, you know, he was sort of the wrong place at the wrong time and probably didn't have any chance of ever really doing anything because of that, because nobody was really going to take on Trump, if you would, successfully. And so um, that's, that's the upshot of that one. But Disney backed down on Wednesday from a long-running legal battle, reads the journal, with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis over control of the Orlando area land that is uh, home to its most important resort, ending years-long feud and handing the governor a political victory. The company's truce with the Central Florida Tourism Oversight District, the entity that oversees the lands, the resort's land and infrastructure, gives DeSantis more power and influence over the company's Florida operations. It also paves the way for Disney to expand its theme parks and resort properties in the state. But everything they have done according to DeSantis, is in the best interest of the state of Florida, and we've been vindicated on all those actions. Don't forget, remember they had that Reedy Creek Improvement District, and Walt Disney himself, when he did the original deal, he got all these acres, and he was like, okay, I want to govern this myself, because, you know, hey, if we want to build a roller coaster, and we need to build it really high, we're going to have the ability to do that. We can't get bogged down in all this red tape, bureaucratic red tape. So the state said, okay, you know, you want that swap land? Go for it. You can do what you want there. And so they had this special deal. But nobody else had a deal like that. 
And the deal had kind of run its course. I mean, this was done years and years ago. And so Ron DeSantis sued in part because, don't forget, everything that was going on with the schools and the gender stuff in the schools, et cetera. So they came to a head. Ron sued, um, or rather, I should say, uh, Disney sued, and they lost. So Ron DeSantis winning his case. We're happy to see that. Big news coming out of Florida, as I said. Um, you know, Disney is is in a lot of trouble overall. It's not just what it's been going through with Ron DeSantis, but when you think about how the company as a whole is increasingly more challenged because it's lost its way, it's lost who it was and needs to be. This wokeism, wokeism as a virus, really has kind of taken over. And it's caused the company to produce a whole bunch of flops, like one after another, because it's so focused on having this diversity in color, in gender, in sexual preference, as opposed to diversity of thought. I mean, it's, it's very similar to the MSNBC thing, right? Like, we don't, we don't want anybody that's a, that's a Republican MAGA person here. MAGA is the enemy, right? You have to be a never Trumper. We'll take you then as a conservative. So there's not any kind of real diversity, even if they have a bunch of different looking people, that's not intellectual diversity. And so that's sort of what Disney has been and continues to suffer from. All the people that they hire, they all come from the same schools and they all think alike and they're all producing the same kinds of content. And so along comes Nelson Peltz. Nelson Peltz is a billionaire investor and he's like, you know what? I think this company should be worth more. I think this company ought to be doing different things. I think the company should have a succession plan. Thank you very much. Like Bob Iger, you're not going to live forever. And we need to know what's going to happen when you're not there. Because when you put the other Bob in, things didn't go so well. But maybe that was deliberate, right? Because maybe in that particular case, they didn't really want somebody who could take over in a meaningful way, shall I say, for Bob Iger. And so there's a lot of stuff going on in the background that is very, very, very relevant and needs to be addressed. Well, I want to share with you guys a new story that just came out, and it's kind of telling because it feels now like the mainstream Hollywood media is starting to turn on Bob Iger. Is it because of Nelson Peltz? Is it because the share price has been effectively cut in half just in the last three years? I mean, it used to be trading around 200 bucks a share. Now it's trading about 100 and change. Take a look at what the Hollywood Reporter put out today. This is great. I mean, you can see my little scribbling on my screen. I'm like, wow, Bob Iger's invincible error is over. It reads, and this is Alex Warprin, who I guess is over at Hollywood Reporter now. He writes, after a major Wall Street firm sides with activist Nelson Peltz ahead of an April 3rd shareholders meeting, investors are questioning how the CEO plans to plot out growth and his own succession. So this is a big deal. So this publication itself is super woke. I mean, it's the Hollywood Reporter, for goodness sakes. And Bob is super popular in Hollywood. And Bob is generally liked by people at The Hollywood Reporter. So to run a headline with that picture, it's a wow kind of headline, guys. And it suggests to me that Nelson has a leg to stand on. Now, everybody's like, oh, can you believe Nelson said that? The other day he said something crazy, like, well, why do I have to go to a movie and have only a black cast? Or why do I have to go to a movie and, well, here it is. Here's the quote. Why do I have to have a Marvel that's all women? Not that I have anything against women, but why do I have to do that? He's sort of saying to the producers, like, can't you just kind of be a little more inclusive? Why can't I have Marvels that are both men and women? Or why do I need to have an all black cast? Like why? Like, you know, mix it up a little. And he's got a point, but like, this is no go territory. This is dangerous territory because no sooner did he say these things, it was in an interview with the FT. It came out on Friday of last week. No sooner did he say this, but Bob Iger and company and the really sort of well-heeled PR machine going on there at Disney, they started attacking Nelson Peltz, the activist investor, for saying these things, saying, well, clearly, clearly, he doesn't know what he's talking about. How could we ever have this guy involved in our company? And they, well, Blackwell's Capital, that's a, a firm that has sided with Bob Iger. They came out and slammed him for his, quote, disturbing statements about the Marvels and Black Panther. 
Okay. So you see how this is going down, except that, okay, that was Friday. And here we are today, Wednesday, like a week away from the meeting, the big meeting on April 3rd, the shareholders meeting and shareholders are like, yeah, maybe Nelson has a point. I mean, after all you keep producing sequels. Can you come out with something new, please? And you have no succession plan for Bob Iger. Who the heck is going to take over? We can't have a repeat of Bob Chapek. Or then shareholders are really on the skids. So this is, this is a problem for Disney. And they even admitted in their last, uh, in their annual shareholder report that came out last fall, they said, you know, part of our problem is that our clientele doesn't really see eye to eye with where many of our employees are. Okay, guys, like it's a business. Da -da -da. Shocker. It kind of reminded me a little bit of Bud Light, right? Because it's a business. And if you get a bunch of fratty guys drinking your beer and they love your beer, are you really going to just alienate them? If you're Disney and you've got a bunch of families, like wholesome families from the middle of the country that love going to Disney World, are you going to alienate them? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, as a shareholder, I'd say this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So it gets me back to why I'm such a proponent for doing your own research and thinking about what you're investing in and not taking whatever the big banks are trying to hand you by way of their research that they disseminate down. And it's so clunked up with a bunch of gobbledygook, you know, they can't even tell you in English what they really think. And so my thought is we need to actually communicate with people like real information about companies because this is their future and we need to get the ESG stuff out of there and you need to make educated decisions. So again, 76research.com. I'm so proud of this. Rob has done an incredible job alongside me. He's really like, he's, he's hardcore analyst, like numbers, 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 numbers. I'm very macro. So I can kind of see the big picture. And then he gets in there and he digs and he digs and he digs and he digs and he has all these different criteria for what he's looking at. You know, yesterday we talked about dividends and the sort of distraction, for example, of yields. Like you're always looking for the yield, but you also have to take into consideration the kind of company is. I loved when he said, it's like, can you judge how wealthy a person is by the car they drive? You can't because a lot of people just choo choose to, you know, drive an old jalopy has nothing to do with what their wealth might actually be. You might make certain perceptions, you might have a perception, you might make an interpretive sort of analysis quickly of what you think that person's net worth is, but it may have nothing to do with who they are. So it's the same kind of thing with companies. So you can't just look, for example, at the yield in a dividend stock. He's got 10 to 15 plays in the income builder portfolio, and he changes them out if he thinks it's needed. Um, and, and he and I work very, very closely on this. We have a new report coming for you on Friday. So go sign up 76 research.com. I actually put it in the chat earlier. You know what? I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. Um, it's easy to remember though. Don't you think 76 research and we chose 76 obviously because, uh, 1776 was a pretty big year. And there's something about freedom and independence and sort of economic prosperity that all go hand and hand. Um, yes. Thank you guys for, I, I think I'm, I'm getting some comments on the dress again. <laughs> I look, I feel great. I hope I look great. I feel great. I feel great. And everybody's teasing me. They're like, keep up those vitamins, Trish. I'm going to tell you what they are. They're a new sponsor on the show. Actually, I've been taking them for several months now, and I just think they're terrific. I can get my fruits and veggies every single day. It would be balance of nature, balanceofnature.com. Go check this out. I get you a 35% discount and what else? Oh, $10 off plus free shipping. If you sign up, if you use my name, if you say, you know, Trish is looking good. I think I'm going to give this a shot. I actually do feel really good. And I feel even better because I'm not just saying this in a vacuum. When I go to their website, I see all the commentary from people over the last 20 years saying how wonderful this stuff is for them. And I've got my kid's music teacher who called me the other day and said, Trish, I, I was listening to your show. I didn't even know you listened to the show. And, oh, you've got balance. You're taking balance in nature too. And they're one of your sponsors. I think this is great. I've been taking this stuff for years and years and I love it. So balance of nature, 1-800-246-8751. You can give them a ring. Use my name, my first name, Trish as a code word and sign up. I, I promise you the fruits and veggies. That's what I love them. And they're, they're good for you and they're healthy for you. And you're going to get what you need and 
tell me, because I think you're going to feel better. I mean, I certainly do. I, I've got lots of energy for a whole variety of reasons, of course, one of which is the success we're seeing on this channel. We're just growing every single day. It's just incredible. I, um, I did promise you something on, on P. Diddy, and I know it's getting late, but I, I want to share this one last story with you here because this is unbelievable. Actually, I credit Drew with finding this. So Drew and I were talking about Diddy, and I'm like, you know, uh, I don't like his music. I don't like him very much. I don't like the whole persona. None of this really surprises me. Like, you know, just look at the, the lyrics and the songs and like, you know, like, I don't know. Like, I, I'm just, uh, but it's turning into a big deal. And given what I just heard that Drew played me on MSNBC, I think it actually could turn into a, a really big deal. And the more I think about it, this story is important for us to talk about because there are too many people in this country that get away with a lot. that get away with things they never should get away with. Frankly, crimes. I, I think about, you know, Hunter somehow not paying millions of dollars in taxes. And I don't even think I have to say alleged on that, right? Because he got the handout from the lawyer who helped him pay the tax bill. And I think about what happened with Jeffrey Epstein and the horror there. And this story kind of feels a little like that. Um, Diddy had really been, this is, I think the New York post pointing this out, a kind of untouchable for decades and decades, right? Like they, they couldn't, they couldn't go near him. And yet there were all these rumors out there and all this chatter about how he was really bad. I mean, by look at the lyrics in his songs, like, there, I mean, not that, not that somebody is their lyrics. I, I'm careful about not making that kind of connection, but there was a lot of information out there and nobody did anything. And now all of a sudden, the feds are showing up at the doorstep. Do we have that tape from the local Fox affiliate? Holmes, the rapper and music executive, perhaps being linked to a sex trafficking investigation. He got some shots of a few people coming out of the home. Those people have been detained. Now we're trying to still connect the dots. We do have some sources on scene here that we're getting this information from. We were actually the first ones here with about different law enforcement vehicles at least. There are three Bearcats on scene here. This just all unfolded, Sandra, I would say less than 10 minutes ago. We got here even before the crime scene tape came up. So uh, we're just down the hill. If you look up the street where Tony is right now to the right, you'll see one of those Bearcats and law enforcement. On the other side of those bushes, basically, is that home that is registered to Bad Boy Films, which is part of Bad Boy Entertainment. And the home in particular is registered not only to Bad Boy Films, but to one of P. Diddy's daughters. They are heavily armed and uh, they've been very tactful. Would probably be the best word to use as they uh, made entry into this home uh, this afternoon. We actually watched them as they made through their made their way through one of these uh, side gates, and as soon as they got inside the home, one of the things, the first things they did was made their way into this garage that you see is open right there. Now, they did take a couple people into custody. We witnessed that. Now, are they under arrest? Are they just being uh, asked about what they know? That I can't answer, but I can tell you there's three people right there that were taken into custody today we're, we're inside that home at the time of the raid we did see okay so it's a big deal it's a big deal and it, it's believed that there was illegal trafficking sexual trafficking possibly minors um we're going to get a lot more information in the coming days but it's important because it, it's necessary that people don't think that they can just get away with anything because they have a lot of money and they have a lot of connections. You call this one and that one. And it's something that was mentioned on a, a program, <laughs> dare I say MSNBC, um, but they actually covered this. And I thought in a fair way by bringing this guy on, uh, Torre, I think is his name. He's sort of a podcaster type. And he talked about a story that he hadn't mentioned before about a family member that had gone to work for Diddy because he knew Diddy, he called Diddy, can get my family member a job and I'll, I'll let him explain it because it's kind of spooky. It's a little surreal. And if there's truth there, it, it kind of speaks volumes and it's, it's good news that the feds are busting this up.
But it seems part of uh, part of his whole life, his whole journey has been this sort of scorched earth campaign where you see him continuing to succeed or do big things and leave people in his wake hurt. We go back to CCNY, which he a, a, a party that he overpromoted that people yes. ended up getting killed. You think about the many artists who either left, you know, in complaint or went to the church or, you know, died Thanks. after, you Sorry. know, I mean, there was a lot of dis, a lot of disheartened artists who left him yeah. that he raised up Shine. And, uh, on and on. Um, and now this, this large growing number of people who are alleging crazy stuff yes. about him. Yeah. And these are things that people in the industry have been hearing about. It's giving time. R. Kelly to right. It's giving it's 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 disturbing. You know, I was personally disturbed many years ago. OK, I, I, this is interesting. I know this man well enough to call him and say, hey, I need a favor. Yeah. And this might have been 10, 12 years ago that I called him and say, hey, I have a family member who I want you to hire them as an intern. Yeah. And uh, I have never talked about this publicly. And I and he said, yes. And they were flying around, one of the interns, Atlanta, Miami, whatever, on the jet, in the house, whatever. And then the internship stopped abruptly, like three or four months into it. Yeah. And I spoke to my family member, like, well, what happened? And they wouldn't say. Yeah. And I'm like, what, what do you, why did it end? And he wouldn't yeah. say. And years later, they finally came out, and this is a male, yeah. and said that uh, Puff had said, come home, stay the night with me, or the internship is over. And they said, absolutely not. He said, absolutely not. Uh, and the internship ended. Uh, but from there, I was like, oh, like oh, this is this is God. how it goes. OK. Yeah. OK. So to hear that things went even further with potentially, allegedly many other people. Yeah, it, it, it's it's not I don't it, you know, we, we feel like we've seen this coming. Yeah. And so. If these things that have been alleged are true, this guy needs to go down and he needs to go down hard and all the people that were around him allowing for this, they need to go down too. So this is a big deal. It is my understanding that they now have him in custody. And I think a lot, a lot, ladies and gentlemen, is going to happen. So Sean Combs, a.k.a. P. Diddy, <coughs> who has built quite a music empire. Um, really just creepy, creepy stuff. I, I see some of you guys mentioning that teenage Justin Bieber video resurfacing. I saw that where he talked about, you know, um, all the fun things or whatever they were going to do. Um, apparently, we're, 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 we're learning that some of these alleged victims have been coming forward. And as a result of that, um, th these victims are... are allegedly speaking very candidly with the feds right now. And so the, the hope or the thinking is that they're going to have enough here to really take the guy down. But what, what a disgusting, disgusting situation really. Um, but listen, people, just because you get a lot of money, just because you're really successful, that does not give you the right to do. I mean, I, I can't even, I don't even like talking about these things, but just awful, awful stuff. Let's try and remember, you know what? You only go this way once. A good person, enjoy it. Keep your keep your loved ones close and and value them because, really, that's um that's all we've got. I thank you for being here. Thank you so much for being here, it, Mike. It's good. Mike's a team member now. Mike Costa. We got a lot of team members growing. I'm gonna be back with you. Um, by the way, uh oh, how do I put that? I don't know how we're gonna figure that out, Drew. When they when they uh. Donate to the show. I'd like to be able to put up the comments. We'll, we'll work on that. But Alaric, thank you for your support. That's very kind of you. All of you guys. I mean, listen, just, just keep doing what you're doing. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. And we're going to grow this thing. And we're going to get the word out. And it's organic. And it's natural. And it's real. And there's no teleprompter. And there's no one telling me what I can say or not say. That's a good thing. I will see you back here tomorrow.